May I ask all of you to close your eyes for a minute. Go back to your childhood and remember your favorite teacher, the one who inspired you, the one you cite as an example of what every teacher should be. Convey your deepest gratitude and regards for him or her. You may open your eyes. I had the privilege of studying under some of the best teachers. The more I looked at them, I found that they were like superheroes or Durga Mata. They had to do a variety of things at the same time. Manage a diverse class of children who learn at very different styles and pace. They had to prepare worksheets for tomorrow, grade homework from yesterday, all this while while delivering a great lesson today and tomorrow and every single day. And yet more, actually deliver a great lesson, but the, there are some children in the class who are not understanding what they did, despite their best intentions. I wondered if technology could help teachers convert their intent to outcomes in learning improvement. And that is a question that I have been working on for the past decade. It all started about 10 years ago when I was in business school. And I figured if I am getting some of the best professors to teach me, surely I could put them on video, put it on a channel that would broadcast it to others, and education would be democratized. It wouldn't be confined to the hallways of the prestigious institutions. I realized my idea was hardly new, and so I went out and saw some places where children were learning of videos from the best teachers. Surely there was a group there that was very motivated and actually very diligently learning from them. But there were others, others who were peering into what their neighbor's screen was showing, others who were looking outside the window and yet more who were looking at the screen, but at the end of it, if you talk to them, they hadn't really understood much, either because the topic was too complex or it was in a different language. I realized that solving this problem of how technology can help improve teachers isn't an easy one. It isn't as simple as it sounds. And that was one major lesson I took away was that technology would have to be adaptive to each student. You know, why should Nikunj watch a four minute video when he can learn it in two minutes? If Akshay needed a different style and a different visual, and Pranav needed seven because he didn't understand an underlying concept, we shouldn't all be watching the same four minute video. That was the first takeaway. As I was graduating, there was a professor who asked to a room full of us on what is the purpose of life? How will you measure your life? And that got me thinking deeply. I started thinking that I had solved problems before on the factory floor, in management consulting, and in private equity. But is there a bigger, more meaningful problem that I could solve? And I realized that you know, the problem is more graver in India. We stood second last in the world on the PISA test. And over the last two decades, our learning outcomes have flatlined. And there are 300 million students who are going to school each day. So I decided to come back to India in a very typical Swadesh-like moment. <laughs> and I you know, didn't want to re-engineer everything uh, as they say, reinvent the wheel. So I traveled India. I wrote cold to people who were working in the education sector asking for an appointment. Whoever replied back, I took the train down and spent a few days with them. In this journey, I found a group of diverse people working in a nondescript building in 45 degrees Celsius in Ahmedabad called Educational Initiatives. I was struck by their vision, a world 
where every child is learning with understanding. And I decided to join them in this mission. They had an adaptive learning program, and you know, we had a lot of great content on the internet. So I said, you put those two together, and boom, problem solved. Obviously, after an MBA, solving problems in ivory towers was an abundant oversupply. And so, you know, one of the co-founders, Sridhar, sat me down and asked me a seemingly innocuous question. Why is it, as a society, we have a better mobile phone every three months, but haven't fundamentally changed the way our students learn? You know, and this question got me thinking. There, was, there is a lot of reports out there that show that over the last 20 years, learning levels in India have stagnated. And we need to sort of improve this. We need to prepare ourselves for the future. And so the problem isn't as simply as having a technology solution, having some videos, and just putting it all together in an adaptive platform. He asked me to pull out my latest cell phone, open Google, and type the words, percentage of population with diabetes. Immediately, the answer comes up, 9.3%, without you even having to click on a link. If you enter the same search of percentage of population that cannot multiply, a percentage of students in grade five who cannot multiply, even after two pages of search, you wouldn't find that information. Take it to the next level. Reasons for diabetes, reasons for high blood sugar, you will find a very carefully curated list of reasons that the medical community has converged on. Try Googling reasons why children cannot multiply and you would not find this. Imagine a new young doctor who has access to all this well-researched knowledge that he or she can start from. And imagine a well-intentioned teacher who is actually motivated, getting well-paid, and wants to do well, and tries the same Google, but isn't getting the information. And so, for there's a lot of content out there, but that content has to be grounded in this body of knowledge for us to be having the same effect that the medical world did. Did you know that only 80 years ago, doctors in medicine made no difference at all. And now, doctors in medicine make all the difference. And it's because over the last 80 years, there's been tremendous research done in the field of medical science with several you know, phase one, two, and three trials. We will need the equivalent research in education for us to have that large-scale impact. And so my bubble you know, broke for the second time. The first time was I understood that it needed to be adaptive. The second time, that content had to be based in a body of knowledge that is proven to improve learning, or as Sridhar calls it, a science of learning. Now that we had you know, these two uh, and we did more work, let's sort of see how we would diagnose. Here is a video of Gaurav trying to read a passage that he should have mastered by this age. Let's listen to him. इधर उधर उड़कर पानी ढूंढा पानी कहीं ना मिला अचानक उसे एक घरा दिखाई दिया। He was essentially decoding, but not reading with comprehension. Now let's look at Garv a few months afterwards. समझदार कौआ एक बार बड़ी गर्मी पर रही थी एक कौआ बड़ा प्यासा था इसने इधर उधर उड़कर पानी ढूंढा पानी कहीं ना मिला अचानक उसे एक घरा दिखाई दिया राइट सो ही इज मच बेटर ही इज नॉट परफेक्ट बट ही इज मच बेटर एंड यू बेसिकली स्टार्ट लुकिंग एट वेयर इज ही स्टिल नॉट इंप्रूविंग एंड डू सिस्टमेटिक वर्क ऑन दैट देयर इज अ लॉट ऑफ न्यूज़ दैट सेज you know, half of grade five students cannot read grade two reading material. 
But the way to solve this problem is to start looking at like an engineering problem. Get into the details of what is needed, start building solutions, work iteratively, and that is how we, one would get. The third lesson I learned was that for technology to really help students in learning, it would have to be in vernacular language. In remote parts of Sikkim, we would need to provide Nepali support. It, English can be there as an additional subject, but you know, no matter where you go, when we worked in urban Delhi, we found that children who came from very different backgrounds tremendously benefited when there was vernacular support built in. You know, in this picture, in the center, this girl is Ria. You know, she came in one day, and you know, I was feeling pretty good that day. I was feeling like, okay, finally it seems like maybe we have found some solutions. And I asked her, Ria, approach kyo aate ho? Why do you bother coming in every day? And she replied back, Kyunki mujhe Ritu Didi bhaat achhi lagti hai. Wo bhaat achhe se padhati hai, aur mujhe bhaat maza aata hai mere friends. And I was, you know, so she basically said she likes the, the teacher, she likes the friends, she, she has a lot of fun when she comes here. And I was a little mystified. You know, I, all this while, I was thinking about how technology would help students learn, completely discounting the fact that students also need a human touch. They also need the emotional support. They also need the social factors. And so we immediately changed our program design and started including you know, a, a more balanced blend of what teachers could do and what technology could do together. As we sort of scale this program in rural parts of Rajasthan, I realize it's very difficult to find teachers who are skilled to teach higher order concepts. Even something as simple as, let's say, grade six maths and decimal comparison. Let's understand that with an example. Many students, when asked to pick which is a bigger number between 3.27 and 3.3, pick that 3.27 is a larger number. They say that 27 is larger than 3, or sometimes 327 is larger than 33. There's another set of students who pick that 3.18 is a bigger number than 3.27. When probed, they say that, you know, 8 is bigger than 7, 8 is in the hundredths position, hundredths is bigger than tenths. Or they might even say that the number on the right is 3.81 and the number on the left is 3.72. Again, it doesn't happen to every student, but there are 3% students who think this way. 3% is a big number when you multiply it with 300 million students who go to school in India. A third set of students who say that 3.27 is a bigger number than 3.39. And you know, this isn't a pattern that you would see in the first two examples that I showed you. And the University of Melbourne has found that there are five different types, at least, you know, of students who have these different types of thinking. Imagine, you are the best teacher in the world, you're super motivated, you come into a class of 50 students, and it is your job to figure out which of these students have which combinations of these misconceptions? And then, once you've figured that out, you have to remediate them on this concept and on the 50 other concepts in grade six and maths. That would be an incredibly difficult task, right? It would be almost like lifting a 50 kilogram weight. But can technology help us in this regard? In this case, what we did was, you know, on the front end, this looks relatively simple. You have a student who logs in, who's answering a variety of questions. While on the back end, we've built a complex maze where the responses to the questions are systematically captured in the diagnosis stage by asking them 30 pairs of decimals. We then categorize them into seven different buckets, and children could have more than one. And then each of them gets a personalized part. It's very similar to when you go to a doctor and he says, let's get an x-ray done, okay? For this particular part, let's get a blood test or an MRI done. And then he looks at your reports and he says, okay, you have these two issues, let me prescribe you an individual medication. No doctor has called all the 20 patients in the waiting room together and said, let me prescribe your medicine, 
right? Everybody gets a personalized treatment. And in one day, a doctor could see 50 to 60 patients, all with personal attention. Can technology you know, really help teachers do the same? So this is me trying to raise a 50 kilogram weight in the classroom, right? At this instance, you could give me all the rewards in the world you want. You could give me a promotion, you could give me more money, you could give me anything. But with my lean structure, lifting this 50 kilogram weight, which is the equivalent of having 50 students in the classroom understand decimals correctly, I would still not be able to do it. You could punish me. You could threaten me, you could put a CCTV camera on me, you could transfer me, but I still wouldn't be able to lift that weight. What I need now as a teacher is more support. And my advocacy on this is can technology you know, help convert teachers' intent into lifting the equivalent of 50 kilogram weight? Archimedes famously said, if you give me a lever long enough and a place to put it on, I can move the world, right? And can technology do that for teachers? These are the pyramids. We know some heroes who lifted a lot of heavy weight to build this. It was built about 4,000 years ago. It's about 140 meters tall, about 35-story building. And it took, you know, estimates vary, but it took about 10,000 people to build it. More recently, other heroes built the Burj. It is seven to eight times more taller than the pyramid. And, you know, again, it took a lot of humans to build it. So technology doesn't necessarily replace humans, but it helps them achieve much greater heights. So I think technology also helps us to replicate that success much faster. How many buildings do we know that exist in the world today that are higher than 35 floors, right? So ultimately, we packaged all of this together. You know, we have technology that can be adaptive with content that is based on research in vernacular language and with data that's iteratively used to make it better. And then what you see is a combination of the best of man and the best of machine together. Early results are showing that we're doing twice as better than a control group, which is like building, you know, in this picture, the Eiffel Tower compared to the pyramid. If I can request you to close your eyes again. Remember that teacher you did at the beginning of this talk. She was the one great pyramid then. Now imagine a future where our children are studying with a combination of the best teacher and technology to be able to get the equivalent of Burj in terms of learning.